Okay, in this video, we are gonna do this sample AP Precalculus FRQ number one. It turns out that uh, the AP Precalculus FRQs kind of always are gonna look the same year over year. Uh, I based this one that I wrote on um, the College Board AP Precalculus uh, course and exam description, which you can find online if you look for it, or maybe I'll link it below. Um, so I wrote this problem, let's see what it looks like. So uh, I'm just gonna bounce, you could pause this and try to solve it on your own. All right, for the first part, we have let f be an increasing function defined for x greater than zero. Values of f are shown in the table above. The function g is defined by g of x equals 2x squared plus 3x over 3 minus 4x. So what's gonna happen in this uh, FRQ every year, basically, is you're gonna be given uh, two functions, uh, two representations, like a table and um, you know a function or a graph of a function, some combination of the two. And then you'll be asked uh, largely the same questions it looks like. So uh, first up, we're gonna have the function h of x, which is a new function, is g of f of x, and they're giving us the notation two different ways. Um, it's composition, and we wanna find h of two. So the way that I usually start with these is I like to actually show the summing in. So I would say that uh, I'm finding h of two, and h of two, should be g of f of two. I think that's an important step because it lets you go back and check your work. Now what we need to do is we really need to find f of two. So look at the table, the table gives us values of f. So f of two, we can see is when x is two, f is six. So we're really trying to find g of six. Now at this point, we're mixing between the two functions and the representations. g is given to us as a function. So I grab my calculator, just gonna screenshot it for you. I have a lot of videos on how to use your calculator. Uh, I defined g of x because I didn't know if I was going to need to use it a lot. And then I just found g of 6. So I plug 6 into g of x um, and I get uh, negative 30 over 7. And that's it. Um, you're going to see this a lot. Like they really want to know if you understand compositions. Basically, they really want to understand. They want to know if you really understand the key concepts in the course. And so uh, you could expect to see this question, uh, various representations. Uh, part two here says find the value of f inverse of nine. So you got to know what the notation f inverse means or indicate that it is not defined. Um, so let's see, I'm going to write down f inverse of nine equals, and then we got to think about it. So f inverse is the inverse of f, obviously, which means that this nine that we're looking at here is actually a y value for f of x. So then we just go to our table and we find the y value that is nine, or the value of f of x that is nine, um, we can see that it occurs here. So the answer to this question will be the x value that generates that nine. So three is our answer. Um, now, sometimes you'll see a question like, is the function invertible? Does it have an inverse? Um, so to deal with that, I'm just gonna write it up for you. So we know that this is an increasing function. So an increasing function means that each, um, each output could only possibly be associated with one input. Um, and because of that, we can say, since f is increasing, each output value is associated with only one input value. Um, and so f of x is invertible. So an increasing function or a decreasing function will definitely be invertible because essentially they are one-to-one -one functions. You cannot say that it is because of the horizontal line test. So don't, don't try to use that as your justification for a function having an inverse. They really want to hit like what happens, uh, like each input has one output, that's a function. Each output has only one input. That is an invertible function or a one-to-one -one function. Uh, let's look at part two or part B rather of this thing. Eventually I'll learn how to read them. So it's same setup. Find as decimals all values of x such that g of x equals four. Now if you have a TI Inspire CAS, you can just use solve. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna use a graphing approach. I actually think that's a little bit safer. Um, they like say that you need to be able to do that. They don't say you need to be able to use self. So I have graphed this thing. Then I use menu 814 to find the intersection points. And then I'm just gonna write them down. Um, so this is really uh, a test of, can you use your calculator, I guess, on this particular question. Uh, the next question is determine the end behavior of g of x as, well, I guess I should say the answers. The answers were approximately negative 10.094 and approximately 0.594. You're gonna round to three decimal places unless otherwise specified. So mark that down in your brain, always three decimals unless otherwise specified. Um, part two, so B, 
part two. Determine the end behavior of g of x as x decreases without bound. Express your answer using the mathematical notation of a limit. So it's not clear to me if I can just use a limit or if I have to like say words as well. Um, so I'm gonna do both of those, but I actually personally think that just writing down a limit would work here. So if x is decreasing without bounds, um, that would mean that we are approaching negative infinity. So we're gonna write the limit as x approaches negative infinity of g of x. You gotta like put that function there to get the notation correct. And then if we just look at the graph, as you go toward negative infinity, this thing is just gonna keep going up, right? So if the values are going up, we're gonna say that they just increase without bound or approach positive infinity. So I would say infinity. Then I would write down this sentence. So as x decreases without bound, basically I'm repeating what they said, um, the output values, or I think you could just say g of x, um, increases without bound or tends toward positive infinity would be something that I would also accept. I just, they haven't given the exam uh, yet, and so they haven't scored the exam, so I don't really know 100% how they're going to accept answers, but I do know that everything I'm writing is correct mathematically, and so there's no reason it would not be accepted. Now, part C of this question, I think, is almost always going to ask you, like, for the table that they give you, or I suppose if they give you a graph, like, what model best fits it, and then I think they might ask you if the function is invertible or... Uh, you know, like anything like that. So I chose when I wrote this one to just go with uh, what model best fits it. Now they've listed in the sample in the CED, they listed the four choices here. So linear, quadratic, exponential, logarithmic. I don't think this will ever be a trig function because there's a whole FRQ devoted to trig functions. So you're really just going to have to choose between these four. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and uh, kind of like eliminate as I go. So I kind of just hope that it's linear, but I honestly do not think it will ever be linear because linear is kind of the easiest one. So for linear, what we want to do is, you note immediately it's like one to two, two to three, three to four, like the X coordinates are always increasing by one. So those are constant. Um, so on these intervals, right, we, we first increase by two, then we increase by three. That is definitely not a property of linear functions, right? Linear, the average rate of change on any interval will always be the same. Um, and here we have an average rate of change of two and then an average rate of change of three. This is not linear, so cross it out. For quadratic, we wanna look at the second differences. To look at second differences, you'd actually need three first differences. So like from four to six is one of the first differences, from six to nine is a second. So here I'm gonna find from 27 over two to nine. So that's 27 over two minus 18 over two. This is a calculator question, so I don't know why I'm doing this uh, in my head, but I got nine halves. Now, second differences just means uh, find the difference in these, right? So from two to three is one, and then from three to nine halves is three halves. It's nine halves minus six halves is three halves. The second differences are not the same. So a quadratic does not work for this. If this was quadratic, then we would have gotten like one and one, or we would have gotten three halves and three halves. We didn't do it, that's out. So now we're gonna move on to exponential. So for exponential, um, I also, I kind of like, I actually think that it will, if I had to guess, I would guess that it will go exponential, then quadratic, then logarithmic. Those are my guesses for like the commonality, how common these things will be, but that's purely speculation. And you need to know how to do all of them, and none of them is really harder than the other. So uh, exponential, we're gonna find uh, the ratio of consecutive terms. So for example, we're going to do six divided by four, right? And when we do that, we get three halves. Now we're going to do nine divided by six, nine divided by six, also three halves. So at this point, I'm pretty confident because I have to choose just one of these four. This has to be exponential, right? The uh, increasing the input by a fixed amount will multiply by a fixed ratio or a factor. Um, so I'm pretty confident. I'll do one more. So 27 over two divided by nine. Remember, it's calculator, three halves again. So we're getting three halves every time. This is definitely exponential. So what we'd write is just uh, f of x is best modeled by an exponential function. It's kind of weird because it doesn't say like show any work or anything. Now in part two, it does say give a reason for your answer. So I'm gonna give what I believe to be the standard reason for this. Um, and I will write it down and uh, read it off for you. I think that what you wanna do is, is kind of master this. So uh, every time the input value 
increases by one, although that's only in this case, so like maybe it's increasing, you know, on another table, it could increase by five every time or by 10 every time, whatever. Every time the input value increases by one, the output value um, is increasing by a factor of, and then just fill in the blank. So in this case, it's increasing by a factor of three halves. It's also possible that it could decrease by a factor of like two thirds or something like that. So if the ratio is greater than one, you're gonna say increases. If it's less than one, we're gonna say decreases. But we've said increases by a factor of three halves. Therefore, an exponential model works best. And I think that's all you need to do. Um, I do wanna share with you, because I actually think this is like the hardest part of this particular FRQ, would always be to decide what model it is. So what I did was I made this thing. Um, you could screenshot this or whatever you wanna do. Um, these are the models and their justifications. So linear, average rate of change on uh, intervals of equal length. I mean, they say equal length, but it doesn't matter. It would be any interval, but average rate of change will always be the same. Uh, so my justification would be because the average rate of change on any interval of inputs is the same, a linear model works best. I don't think that will ever be the answer, but who knows. For quadratic, we need second differences of the output values are constant. So our justification because the second differences in the output are constant, uh, are a constant, comma, and then say what it is. Like, you know, it's always 12 or it's always like one fifth. Over consecutive equal length input values, um, a quadratic model works best. And then exponential, the output values just change proportionally as the input values increase in equal length intervals. The equal length intervals is really important in uh, AP pre-calculus, so make sure you're always like hitting that fact. Uh, and our justification would be, Every time the input value increases by blank, so like one, two, 10, five, whatever, the output value increases by a factor of blank, whatever the ratio of consecutive terms is, and therefore exponential works best. And then logarithmic is probably the weirdest one because it's actually, if the outputs increase by the same amount, the inputs will change proportionally. And basically, when I'm trying to figure out if it's logarithmic in my head, what I do is just switch the rows of the table, right? So make the outputs, the inputs, the inputs, the outputs. When you switch them, if you got exponential again, then the real answer would be logarithmic. Um, so if you switched X and Y, you would get an exponential function if logarithmic is the correct answer. But the input values change proportionally as the output values increase in equal length intervals. It's definitely the weirdest one. So when you're looking at a table, if you're like, man, this table is weird. Um, like there's, uh, initially your brain will tell you there's almost no pattern in the X values. That's almost certainly logarithmic. Um, and our justification will be every time the output value increases by blank, whatever, five, 10, one, something, uh, the input value will increase by a factor of blank. Therefore, a logarithmic model works best. So that's what you're going to want to do. Uh, definitely, uh, this is something you can study for. Memorize everything on this page. Uh, I hope this was helpful and good luck.